Thanks for checking out this online resource. We here at Calvary Community Church hope it's a help to you in your own spiritual journey. But online resources can't replace our engagement with the local church, where we can serve with others, we can worship with others, we can do life together and reach out to the community. If you live near Calvary, we invite you to join us 6 p.m. Saturday or 9 or 11 Sunday morning for one of our weekend services. If you live at a distance, just email us at info at calvarycc.org and we'll help you find a church where you can get grounded and growing in Christ. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you that you walk with us through not only the high points of life, but those low points where we struggle, where we suffer. Thank you for being with us in those moments too, and for your faithfulness continuing through even the darkest hours and the most difficult circumstances. Father, our hearts go out to the people of Virginia Beach. We pray a comfort to the families of, of those who were taken. Lord, our community knows some of what they're going through, and we pray for the leadership there. We pray for uh, churches in the area. May the body of Christ love folks and, and be with folks in their pain. And uh, may the good news of Jesus be able to be shared in this uh, difficult time. And Father, we pray for our nation. We pray for our president and the Congress. We pray for our state, the governor and the legislature. Lord, we ask for local community leaders around the country. We pray you'd give them wisdom and help them to know how best to lead. And may their hearts reflect in their lives your values. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you all very much. In the 1970s, uh, there was a little bit of a pop phenomenon that happened, and that was there were these individuals who were daredevils. You remember them? Probably the most famous of all the daredevils was the guy Evil Knievel. And, uh, you know, he wore the red, white, and blue, and, and uh, this guy was, was quite a daredevil. He would jump cars with his motorcycle, he would jump buses, and he was always adding more, uh, so he'd have to jump longer. And he had a number of crashes and injuries. As a matter of fact, in his career, he broke 433 bones. That's more bones than you have in your body. So he broke some of them several times. Probably his greatest and best known feat happened on September 8, 1974. The U.S. government would not allow him to try to jump over any section of the, Great Can the Grand Canyon. And so he went to Idaho to the Snake River to go over the Snake River Gorge. And if you remember, he had an engineer prepare him a special kind of rocket uh, a craft, and it was steam propelled, and he would launch from one side of this giant ravine with the Snake River down there, and then the idea was he would safely land on the other side. Now, there was a safety parachute that he could push, and then he would come floating down in a safe way if he knew he wasn't going to make it to the other side. There was a lot of hype, a lot of buildup. And then uh, when he took off on that uh, attempt to cross the Snake River, partway up, the emergency parachute, even before he'd gotten very far, right out of the launch, the emergency parachute came out accidentally, and he drifted down, and he even landed on this side of the Snake River where he had launched from, so he didn't even cross the Snake River. But he became more and more famous by these kinds of feats. As a matter of fact, there were... There were simple toys and action figures and motorcycles and everything. There was a, a branding to who he was and his, his daredevil ways. And I was probably about 10 when we started playing daredevil, and specifically we played Evil Knievel in our little dead-end street in Mishawaka, Indiana. Uh, really, there were only a few of us, and my best friend Lance lived next door. We were the same age. My brother was about three or four years younger than us. He's my only sibling, and Lance had a sister who was older, and so she wasn't going to play this with us. And, and uh, so we decided, even in the winter, we thought, what can we do? What would Evil Knievel do when it comes to sledding? 
And so there was this hill we would sled on, and there were these raspberry bushes at the base of the hill that have all the thorns, you know, and the bent branches all intertwined. We saw this kind of opening, and we thought, if we could just get in the sled and go down, we'd risk it all, be a daredevil, we'd be evil Knievel going down the sled and going into the raspberry bushes, and the risk would be how much you'd get cut up, you know, and you'd be this great hero. Well, um, both of us were a little scared of that, so we got my brother Troy. And we convinced him he was evil Knievel. So we put him on the sled and sent him into the raspberry bushes. And then in the summer, we convinced him again he was evil Knievel when, he, when we threw him off of the, the shed and he was supposed to go over into the neighbor's yard over their white picket fence, which was quite a distance from the shed. He rarely made it over in our many attempts. But we convinced him he could be evil Knievel. We were not willing to risk, we were not willing to dare, but we convinced him that he should. You know, in life, there are a lot of ways in which we'll hear the idea of dare. Someone dared to love, dared to hope, dared to dream, dared to try. And I want us to talk about that one I just mentioned, and that is dare to hope. If you want to open your Bibles to Lamentations chapter 3, in Lamentations chapter 3, we're going to notice that Jeremiah, who has this lament in this wonderful Old Testament book, that he dares to hope. That involves risk. And he's doing this when his circumstances really have no hope. And we have been looking at this wonderful book that was written right after the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and the nation of Judah in 586 B.C. The prophet Jeremiah and other prophets have been warning some of the kings of, of uh, Judah that unless they repented, God was telling them as prophets to announce his judgment would come at the hand of their enemies. For 40 years, Jeremiah told five different kings they needed to repent and turn back to God. They needed to turn from their immorality, the injustice, and the idolatry of their culture and turn back to Jehovah God. And they refused, and so God allowed the Babylonians to take Jerusalem. And there was that 20-month siege of that city, and the Babylonians cut it off from resources, and people starved, and it was a horrific time of suffering. And then when they broke down the walls in 586, they came in, and there was much more destruction and damage and heartache and pain. And the last several weeks, we've been looking at this book of Lamentations. It's a poetical book that's very well organized. You remember in chapters 1 and 2, we saw that there were 22 verses in each of those chapters. There are 22 letters to the Hebrew alphabet. And so each of those chapters is an acrostic. And there's structure throughout the book. Even chapter 3 is structure. It's right in the center, and it's a little different. Instead of 22 verses, there are 66, so that there are... Uh, there is a, a pattern that three times each of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet are repeated. We looked at chapter 1 and we talked about how it is healthy to lament. And to lament is to passionately express our sorrow, our grief, or our complaint. And it's even healthy for us as God's children to lament before God when our circumstances have us overwhelmed. We looked in chapter 2 at, at some of the character of God, that he's always with us. That he is sovereignly in control of everything. That he is a God of justice and a God of mercy. And now we come to chapter 3. In the early part of this chapter, Jeremiah has a certain tone. And then that tone changes as you get to the last part of this chapter. And I want us to look into Lamentations 3. If you're there in your hard copy of the Bible or on your mobile device, you can follow along as I read. Hear the heart of Jeremiah in the first part of this poem, Lamentations chapter 3. Verse 1, I am the one who has seen the afflictions that come from the rod of the Lord's anger. He led me into darkness, shutting out all light. He has turned his hand against me again and again all day long. He has walled me in and I cannot escape. He has bound me in heavy chains. And though I cry and shout, he has shut out my prayers. He has blocked my way with a high stone wall. He has made my road crooked. He shot his arrows deep into my heart. My own people laugh at me. All day long they sing their mocking songs. He was filled with bitterness and has given me a bitter cup of sorrow to drink. Look at verse 18. I cry out, my splendor is gone. Everything I had hoped for from the Lord is lost. Now that's just a sampling of some of the verses in the first part of this chapter. 
And you can hear the hopelessness in Jeremiah's cry. He had witnessed this destruction. He had suffered from it too. And now he is lamenting and crying out to the Lord. But then look at some verses toward the end of the chapter and see if there isn't something different in his tone. Look at verse 40 of chapter 3. Look at verse 40. Let us test and examine our ways. Let us turn back to the Lord. Let us lift our hearts and hands to God in heaven and say, We have sinned and rebelled, and you have not forgiven us. Look down at verse 55. But I called on your name, Lord. From deep within the pit, you heard me when I cried. Listen to my pleading. Hear my cry for help. Yes, you came when I called. You told me, do not fear. Now, in the earlier part of this chapter, he says, I cried out to God, and that was worthless. That was hopeless. It didn't help. And now he's saying, I cried out to God, and he heard me. He heard my cry. He told me, don't be afraid. His tone is changing. What has changed? Well, in the center of this chapter, there are some verses that clearly communicate this pivot, this turning point in Jeremiah's heart. As a matter of fact, uh, the paragraph we're going to look at in uh, Lamentations chapter 3, verses 20 through 33, these verses are at the center of this book. In this book, book that is so emotional and yet is so highly structured. Look at chapter 3 and verse 20. I will never forget this awful time as I grieve over my loss. Yet I still dare to hope when I remember this. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. And that phrase is at the very center of the book. We just sang about that. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. Verse 24. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who depend on him, to those who search for him. So it is good to wait quietly for salvation from the Lord. And it is good for people to submit at an early age to the yoke of his discipline. Let them sit alone in silence beneath the Lord's demands. Let them lie face down in the dust, for there may be hope at last. Let them turn the other cheek to those who strike them and accept the insults of their enemies. For no one is abandoned by the Lord forever. Though he brings grief, he also shows compassion because of the greatness of his unfailing love. For he does not enjoy hurting people or causing them sorrow. This section is the turning point in Jeremiah's heart as he's lamenting. It's interesting, though, that in chapters 4 and 5, he goes back to his lament. Even after there seems to be a turnaround in the last part of, of uh, chapter 3. Because of this turning point of these verses we just read. And so he just gets a little glimmer of hope in a book that is a book full of despair and misery. But he dares to hope in the middle of that. And I want us to see together today that when life shouts at you that all hope is lost, you can either dare to hope or surrender to despair. And I believe there are folks who are coming in, who came into this service today. You may be feeling like all hope is lost, like life is shouting at you from multiple directions that all hope is lost. You've experienced grief of someone you love that you've lost. You've experienced the breakup of a relationship, of a marriage. There's strain in your family. There's a medical diagnosis that you just can't believe came your way. There's a setback in terms of your career. You've come in here and you feel like all hope is lost. But you are at a crossroads when you feel that way. When we go through deep waters and dark circumstances, we stand at a crossroad that when life is shouting at us, all hope is lost. We can either dare to hope or we can surrender to despair and misery. And let me tell you this. If you stay neutral, you drift into despair and misery. But God calls on us to dare to hope. And I don't mean that we, we fully embrace all aspects of hope, but we just have a, a, a piece of hope in the midst of our lament and our suffering. And that little piece of hope begins to move us in the right direction, and we hope again, and that we hope again, and we dare to hope again, and God meets us in that moment. But some of us, as we drift or we choose to surrender to despair and to misery, we are focused so much on our circumstances we can't see your God. 
Or we shake our fist at God and say, God, I wanted it this way and you didn't make it this way and so I'm angry with you. And we get stuck in our lament and in the midst of that lament, we never choose to even begin to dare to hope. Verse 21 says, yet I will dare to hope when I remember this. The word remember is very common in the Old Testament. It's one of the most used words. But it usually is not the Hebrew word that's used here for remember. This remember means to return to something again and again and again. It has the idea of rehearsing over and over. As the psalmist would say, he, he would say that he would speak to his own heart. You rehearse over and over again a truth that is so monumental that you begin to see your God in a fresh and new way. Mark Rogop, in his book, Dark Clouds, Deep Mercy, wrote this. We need to preach to our own hearts. We need to use lament to express the sorrow that we feel. But we also need to use lament to rehearse the truths that we believe. We need to interpret pain and judgment through the lens of God's character and ultimate mercy. Hope springs when the truth about God is rehearsed. And for some of us, the sorrow or pain we went through is not just last week or, or just last year, maybe decades ago, and we have been rehearsing the despair and misery so much without any hope that even taking that first step of risk to dare to hope in your God, that is a huge step. It's a huge step. Now, I want us to see these things that we are to rehearse over and over again in our hearts and our minds. And they're given to us here in verses 22 through 33. You see, when you dare to hope, you rehearse over and over again two things. The first thing is this, the faithfulness of God's love. The faithfulness of God's love. Verse 23, at the center of it all, great is his faithfulness. We've got to keep going over as we dare to risk the faithfulness of God's love, even when we don't sense it or feel it. Because God is faithful, First of all, his love never ends. His love never ends. Look at verse 22, the first part of it. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. Faithful love is one Hebrew word. It's my favorite Hebrew word. It's the word chesed. And it is a word that is used hundreds of times, but it's a word that scholars struggle to translate into English. Because it speaks of love, and sometimes they'll translate it mercy, grace, compassion, kindness. It speaks of love, but it speaks of loyalty and faithfulness all at the same time. So while he is loving, he is always loyal and faithful. While he is loyal and faithful, he is always loving, and they are linked. That's the love of God. It's a love that's used only of God. It's the kind of love that we as human beings cannot even begin to express, but we can experience it as we dare to hope in him. His love never ends. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. We sang about the reckless love. Some people said to me, isn't that wrong to sing about the reckless love? Actually, in the setting in which Jesus tells the story, in Luke 15, there are 99 sheep that the shepherd has in the fold, and there's one he goes to get, which goes against all shepherding of the day. And so professionally, other shepherds would look at him and say, that is a reckless love for you to leave the 99 who are safe in the fold and go after the one wayward one. But aren't you glad our God's love is an amazing grace, a faithful, loyal love that is a reckless love that breaks the boundaries of human understanding. And it is a love that never ends. It's eternal It's the kind of love that will never give up on us even when we have failed God. Someone has put it simply, never give up on God because he will never give up on you. His love never ends. Because God is faithful, secondly, his love never fails. This idea here is that it will never drop the ball. It'll never fail you. It always accomplishes what it seeks to accomplish. The last part of verse 22, his mercies never cease. And that word cease speaks of stumble or fall. Coming to an end because it, it, it couldn't last. It, it made a mistake. But God's love never fails. Even when we feel like God has failed us, his love has never failed. He's working something much greater in our lives. 
Warren Wearsby said, we have failed him, but he cannot fail us. Because God is faithful, his love never ends, it never fails. And thirdly, his love is always fresh. It's always fresh. Look at verse 23. Great is his faithfulness. And what is the demonstration of his faithfulness? His mercies begin afresh each morning. Sometimes when we are drifting into despair or misery, we want God to resolve everything from our past in a way that we understand and know all of our future. We want all of the love of God now. For today, tomorrow, the next week, we want to be guaranteed that we will always experience his love the way we want to experience it. And Jeremiah, who's in the midst of suffering and pain with his people, he says, his mercies, his love is new every morning. Do you remember when the nation of Israel was wandering in the wilderness between Egypt and the Promised Land for those 40 years? God provided them manna from heaven. That every morning they got up and there was this bread-like some substance that was sweet on the ground. They'd gather it and there would just be enough for that day. And then the next morning there would be manna again. That's the kind of picture that we get here with his love and his mercies are new every morning. His love is always fresh. We need to look to God for today's love and mercy and compassion to get through what we're getting through today and let God take care of tomorrow's love and the next day's love. If you know Christ as your Savior, could I encourage you to, um, before every, every morning and every evening of this week, do something different about how you go into bed and get out of bed and how you go out of bed and into bed. When you in the morning are waking up and you're about to let your feet hit the floor, before they hit the floor, say, thank you, God, for the love you're going to give me today. Thank you that it will be enough for me today. And then as you go to bed before your feet leave the floor to get in bed, say, thank you, God, for the love you showed me today. It was enough for today, and I'll trust you for tomorrow's love tomorrow. Just do that each day and see if your perspective doesn't change and you don't find yourself beginning in incremental steps to dare to hope as you rest in the faithfulness of God's love because his love never ends, it never fails, it is always fresh. And then, fourthly, his love is always reinvigorating. It brings new energy and new focus. Look at verse 24. I say to myself, this is, again, rehearsing to himself. The Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I will hope in him. Do you sense that in the midst of the suffering, he's got a fresh perspective. He's got fresh energy. Because he has experienced the newness of God's love, he now can say, taking those incremental baby steps toward daring to hope, he says, I will hope in him. You know what most of us do in our experience? As we make this choice between daring to hope and, and drifting into this surrender to despair and misery. Is that we are so focused on our circumstances. That we're putting our, our hope in, not our God, but that our God will change our circumstances to the be, be the way we want them to be. Our hope is in our situation, our setting, the things we're going through. We need to adjust our thinking. And to experience God's love in its reinvigorating way. And that we say, I am going to hope in him. He is my eternal inheritance. Someone has said, God loves you more in a moment than anyone could in a lifetime. We need to choose to put our hope in him, the one who will always love us. His love will never fail. His love is always fresh every morning. And his love is re-energizing, reinvigorating. If you're here today and you say, I want that kind of hope. The very first step to discovering hope in God is to find hope in Jesus Christ as your Savior. And to understand that God loved you so much that he sent Jesus to die to be raised and to be raised from the dead for you so that you could have a relationship with him. So that you'd have that kind of relationship where you can rest your hope in him. Not just for your eternal destiny, which you get at the moment you put your faith in Christ and he forgives you of your sin and gives you a relationship with himself. But that you can put hope in him day after day. It begins. The first step of hope in God is hope in Jesus Christ as your Savior. And if you haven't put your trust in Christ, today would be a great day to do that. What a way to begin the summer and the rest of your life to put your faith in Jesus. 
After each service, our care team and our, ministry, our, our prayer ministry team are down here to pray with you over any issue after the service. You can come down to meet them. And if today you want to share with them you accepted Christ or you have questions, speak to them. I'm available in the lobby. We can have another pastor share with you God's word so you can know that you know Christ and that you have put your feet firmly in the hope of Jesus. Then you can begin to dare to hope as you put your hope in the Lord and you have the strength and energy that God gives you through that. We have to remember this about God's faithful love. Someone has said, God is the arm that will hold you at your weakest, the eye that will see you at your darkest, and the heart that will love you at your worst. We have to rehearse over and over again the faithfulness of God's love in our lives. And if we've been playing those things of despair and hopelessness, feeling like all hope is lost and life is awful, we've got to rehearse over and over again the faithfulness of God's love. Secondly, we need to rehearse not only the faithfulness of God's love, we need to rehearse over and over again the goodness of God's heart. Sometimes we go through circumstances and we think, God, you are a bad God today. God, I don't like the way you're doing this. This seems evil that you would bring this into our family, this loss, this suffering. But ultimately, what we hear in this passage is that our God is a good God. Even when we don't feel like he's being a good God, he has a good heart and he is doing what he believes to be best for us. The psalmist in the famous shepherd psalm of Psalm 23 says this about God's goodness. Surely your goodness and unfailing love, just the love we talked about, that's the word has said. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me, chase me, run after me, chase me down. We sang that in reckless love. The shepherd will go and chase down the sheep. And just like the shepherd will chase down the sheep, the goodness and love of God will chase us down all the days of our life while we're here on earth. And then we'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever where his love will be experienced by us in every way for all eternity. Have you ever had someone chase you to the place where you're exhausted? When I was about 14 years of age, I went to a camp and one of the things they did one night is that we played capture the flag, you know, where there was this big field and then there were woods on either side and, and one team is to hide their flag over here and this team hides and the object is to get the other team's flag and get it back to your side of the, the battlefield and the woods. And, um, and then in this, this way they played it was they put flags on us that were like uh, flag football. Instead of, you know, being shot or whatever, you were, you, they would pull that and then if someone got a hold of that from the other team... Uh, you had to go to their jail, and there was a way your folks could release you, and so this sometimes could last a long time, and they would do it just at dusk, so there are a lot of shadows, and uh, I was, you know, over on the other team's side. I was into their woods looking for the, the uh, flag without getting caught, and I, I sort of noticed there was a, a, a little guy, a younger guy than me, following me, and he kept following me. And so I started to run out of the woods and started to run toward my side. And as I ran out of the woods toward my side, he ran too. And he chased me across this field. And I'm losing my breath. And I'm getting tired. And I get into the woods. And I think I can hide from him. And I kind of hide. Then I see he's catching up to me. So I run some more. And finally, I, I was so exhausted, I just stopped. And he caught up to me. And I said, there, just, just pull it. I mean, I, I can't run from you anymore. And uh, he said, why would I pull it? I'm on your side. I don't know how to play this game, and I was hoping you could show me how. <laughs> you know, God's goodness, according to the psalmist, and what we're going to see from Jeremiah and his lament here, and, and this expression as he dares to hope, is that God's goodness is pursuing us. It's pursuing us. And some of us in our own attempts to solve our own problems are drifting down this path of despair and misery, and God is chasing us with his goodness and his unfailing love, and yet we keep running from him because we don't want his love on his terms. We want things to be our way, and we think that's the only way we can be content. But let's look at the, God, the goodness of God's heart. We've got to rehearse over and over again the goodness of his heart. Because God is good, his heart defines what is good for you. His heart defines what is good for you. Lamentations 3, again, verses 25 to 27. The Lord is good to those who depend on him, to those who search for him. The structure of this little sentence and the next two is that they always start in Hebrew with the word good. And it's the idea that good is the Lord to those who depend on him, to those who search for him. The next one is good, it is, uh, good is the Lord to those who wait quietly for salvation from the Lord. 
The Lord is good uh, to people who submit at an early age to the yoke of his dis discipline. It is goodness from God and is good in your life even if you don't believe that. Even if you think it should be something different. You see, he knows what is good for us. He said it's good for us to depend on him. It's good for us to search for him. It's good for us to wait quietly for his resolution. And we want our resolution in our way, by our terms. And sometimes we say, God, you're only going to be good to me if you work this out the way I want it to work out. That's the only way it can happen. But he says, when we wait for his solution, his way to solve our problem, then we have to wait quietly. And it is good for people to submit at an early age to the yoke of his discipline. And this would be the imagery in that day, as this is being written, where the Babylonians are taking two or three young people of the, of the people of Judah, out of Jerusalem itself even, and they would yoke them, chain them to one soldier, and that soldier would lead them off to Babylon into captivity. And Jeremiah himself had prophesied before the Babylonians came in that that, that season of, of being put under an enemy's oppression would last 70 years and God would preserve a remnant. So that remnant would come out and he would complete his commitment to Abraham that out of Abraham would come this great nation and from that great nation all the nations of the world would be blessed by the Redeemer that would be sent. And that remnant God would hold on to. And we look and we say, but God, you're being so harsh on your people. He's actually being faithful and good to his people because he had told them in Deuteronomy 28, a thousand years earlier, under the law of Moses, that if you break this covenant I'm making with you, if you are unfaithful, I will bring an enemy of yours to you to bring judgment. And it showed mercy to them in that they had decades. They had been idolatrous and immoral and practicing injustice now for a couple of centuries. And God had sent so many prophets and so many warnings, and they laughed and they continued in their waywardness. God is being faithful and bringing that judgment on them. And even their own youth, they're being carried off. And like a Daniel, Shadrach, and Meshach, uh, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they were brought, taken into captivity, and God still used them in that place. And he says the youth need to be willing to submit to that because fighting back is of no use, and God has a plan. He is being good even when you're going through that. His heart defines what is good for you. You know, I think the hardest one in this list of things in verses 25 to 27 for me is to wait quietly. I don't know about you, but I am not a good waiter. In, I, I, I don't wait well in traffic. I don't wait well in store lines. And somehow I always pick the worst line. I'm not very good at waiting. As a matter of fact, this last week I was having lunch with someone at a restaurant here and uh, Westlake, and uh, uh, we got there about the same time, and we walked up to the counter, and we said, two, uh, table for two, please, and they said, it'll be just a few minutes, what name? I said, Sean, and they wrote it down, and then we went and sat down and just waited until our names uh, were called, and um, I, we started talking, and as we're talking, we'd been there about 10 minutes, and I realized there'd been like eight to 10 groups that have gone up to the counter, but walked right to a table, and three or four of them were groups of two, one was a group of like eight people, and so I went up to the counter and I said, excuse me, uh, you're seating a whole bunch of groups and, and I see my name there. My name is the only name on the list. It says Sean 2 and you've seated all kinds of people. He said, oh, oh, yes. Instead of saying, oh, we made a mistake and we overlooked you, he said, oh, yes, 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 you're next, you're next, you're right here on the list. Don't worry, you're next. Well, you've seated all these, oh, I know, but you're next, you're right on the list. And then he like stepped back and counted to like 20 and then walked back up and said, Sean, table of two. Now, the 10 minutes we were waiting really bothered me, but those 20 seconds, they really, really, really bothered me. <laughs> they were the harder part of the waiting. Waiting is not easy, but we hear from the psalmist in Psalm 37, 7, be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Sometimes he'll use you, but we often rush ahead because instead of daring to hope in him, we're working out our own solutions apart from him. Psalm 62, 1 says, For God alone my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation, my rescue. And then a beautiful verse that has made great posters and screensavers comes out of Isaiah 40, in verse 31. They who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. 
Because God is good, his heart defines what is good for you and what is good for me. Secondly, because God is good, as we think about and rehearse in our hearts and our minds the goodness of God's heart, because God is good, his heart describes what is helpful for you, what is helpful for you. He knows what is good, but now he says, and this is an expression of Jeremiah, in the midst of this suffering, and the nation of Judah is wrestling with fighting back against the Babylonians, but they've so crushed them and, and, and humiliated them. We read in verses 28 to 30, what would be helpful in their situation and is helpful in our situation. Let them sit alone in silence beneath the Lord's demands. You've got to bear under these circumstances. Let them lie face down in the dust for there may be hope at last. This speaks of humility. We've got to trust God under the responsibilities of going through those circumstances. We've got to be humble before God. And then it says, let them turn the other cheek to those who strike them. Accept the insults of their enemies. Jeremiah is saying, in this situation, we've been so overwhelmed by the Babylonians, practically he's saying, we shouldn't fight back, we should turn the other cheek, we should just take the insults, because God has said this is going to happen, it's going to last 70 years. But overall in these verses, what is helpful for us is humility before our God. Humility before others. That's what's helpful for us. Because God is good, thirdly, his heart desires what is best for you. Not only what is good for you, not only what is helpful for you, but his heart desires what is best for you. Look what we read here in Lamentations 3, 31 to 33. For no one is abandoned by the Lord forever. Though he brings grief, he also shows compassion because of the greatness, here it is, of his unfailing love, chesed. For he does not enjoy hurting people or causing them sorrow. When you drift down this path or you choose to walk down the path and you surrender to despair, misery, and agony, you begin to believe that God is toying with you, that God is enjoying the suffering you're going through. But it clearly says his heart does not enjoy when there is grief in the lives of his children. He has a good heart. And that phrase there that says, Though he brings grief, he also shows compassion. The word for grief there, or bringing grief, is the idea of intentionally doing something that may hurt for a little while, but there's a purpose to it. So if he allows us to go through circumstances that are heavy, if he takes us through uh, dark storms of life, you have to know his heart isn't to hurt you. He's working something much bigger. Often what he's doing in our lives as followers of Christ is, is molding us and shaping us so we can be more like Jesus and how we live and love in this world. But notice it's linked to that when he brings that grief into our lives, it has an intended purpose, not just to uh, play with us or cause us misery. But he says with that comes his compassion, his love, his unfailing love. He knows what is best for us. When you think of the goodness of God's heart, you have to understand that his heart understands and wants for you what is good, understands what is helpful, understands what is best. As you think about the choice you have and the circumstances you face, you can either dare to hope or you can drift into this surrender to despair, misery, and agony. How do we begin to dare? What, what begins to change our outlook as Jeremiah's outlook even changes? How do we get that little step toward hope? We rehearse over and over again the faithfulness of God's love, the goodness of God's heart for us. I think of that verse again, Psalm 23, 6, Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. His unfailing love, his goodness, is chasing you. And when you dare to hope, he meets you in that moment with enough for that day, not the whole season of suffering, but that day, if you remember his faithful love and the goodness of his heart. Let me simply ask you, are you daring to hope or surrendering to despair? Is your hope in your God or in your circumstance? Many of you know our friend Johnny Erickson Tata, who just the next away from us uh, has her ministry headquarters where she and her team minister around the world to families and individuals affected by disability. Johnny has been in her wheelchair for over 50 years as a quadriplegic. 
She has very little control of her arms, no control of her legs. She's very dependent on others. And then in recent years, she's battled breast cancer. Her first bout with breast cancer was seven, eight, seven or eight years ago. And then uh, the breast cancer reoccurred in the last year toward the end of 2018 into the first couple of weeks of 2019. She did radiation, which is hard on a quadriplegic's body. And she got through that, and she happened to be uh, down at a conference in Orange County where I was. A number of Christian individuals and leaders were there. And I heard one day of that conference that uh, she had been taken to the hospital overnight. And I, I got a call from someone who said, Johnny would like you to come if you have a moment and pray with her and uh, just be with her and Ken. So I went to the emergency room of this hospital in Orange County and found out for about I don't know, about 18 hours already or a little more than that, she had been in this emergency room that just had a little curtain around. And remember, she, uh, as she's there on the bed, can't move but her head and her neck. And it was so noisy, she didn't get any sleep, and she'd had some problems breathing. And, you know, for a quadriplegic, the, the, the lack of being able to breathe is, is overwhelming. It, it, it's, it, for any of us, it's a trouble, but for her, it's just overwhelming. And she talked about how hard it was to be in there, and she expressed some of her, her pain and her sorrow and the difficulty she was facing. And uh, she said how much she wanted to get back up here so she could go to Los Robles where her doctors were, and they know the medical people there, they know the hospital, and so they wanted to go there. And so we prayed about that. And after about 36 hours in this emergency room with all this noise and chaos, she was transferred to Los Robles and got there late in the evening. The next day, I went to see her, and as I walked in, I said, it's so good that you're up here. And, and uh, eventually, by the way, there they were able to help her, and uh, she's actually, because of what they were to help her with, is sleeping better now than she's slept in about a decade. And she's relieved, even though she had to go through all that. But when I got to the, uh, the hospital room, and I came in and I said, I'm so glad you made it up here, and the, the ride wasn't too eventful in the ambulance and everything. I, I'm so glad you made it here. And she said, so am I. God has been so faithful. And all the way from there to here, his goodness has chased me here. It ran after me. Now, there's a woman who understands what that means. And she celebrates God's faithful love chasing her, his goodness chasing her. What about you? Do you dare to hope in your God, even when circumstances would say just drift into despair? Do you dare to hope? The beginning stages and steps of Daring to Hope involve rehearsing over and over again the faithfulness of God's love and the goodness of God's heart. Father, I pray for those in the room who feel like all hope is lost, that life from every direction has been shouting at them that all hope is lost. I pray that as the natural path is to drift toward this misery and agony, I pray, Father, that you would help them to rehearse again and again the faithfulness of your love and how good your heart really is. That they might find hope in you because we'll never find hope in our circumstances. We love you. Thank you for the relationship you give us through your son Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.